Welcome to Discography, the music podcast that delivers the objective truth about the entire discography of every single artist and band that ever existed. I'm your host, Dave Gebro, and if you're tuning in for the first time, ask yourself this. Do you think most modern discussions about music lack a certain fire and perspective? If the answer is yes, then welcome home. Please join our Facebook group, Discography Soldiers of Sound. We're on Instagram and Twitter too, but the Facebook group really is home. Home of artists, writers, filmmakers, musicians, you name it. Overall, a melting pot of unbelievably talented sons of bitches. If you like what you hear, my recommendation is to join the group, then join up on the rest of the platforms too. Then, pretty please, rate the podcast five stars, along with a beautifully worded review, especially if you're on Apple or Spotify. It'll help a lot. Above and beyond that, Discography is rolling out an incredible tiered Patreon. There is a massive amount of parallel content that will only be coming out on Patreon. So definitely give it a look-see. On whatever platform you do call home, you'll be privy to a never-ending flow of ongoing bonus content, giveaways, free swag, and encouraging words of wisdom on how to never, ever give up on your rock and roll dreams of maintaining a Lester Bangs-like perspective deep into adulthood. Don't forget, the link to our legendary playlist is in the show notes and also on our website at discography.com. This is an invaluable resource if, like me, you just hate listening to shitty songs. Lastly, but not leastly, a heartfelt discography thanks goes out to Joe Cravino and my wife Jen and son Mason, without whose invaluable help on the show, I would be entirely dead in the water. Okay, back to business. First things first, you need to know just how seriously we take this craziness. Discography is heavily researched and the music is always reassessed with fresh ears. We're not just covering albums, Uh uh-uh. We do a searingly honest deep dive analysis of all EPs, singles, comp tracks, relevant solo work, and bootlegs. Every release is slapped with an objectively accurate star rating between zero and five, which allows us all to come face to face with the true shape of an artist's overall arc. In this episode of Discography, we will be returning our spray cans back on Marvin Gaye, <laughs> Supper Club Smoothie turned Fallen Angels snorting toot off a of hooker's took us. This episode is part three of three, and the second one in a row with David Ritz as the special guest, which we are thrilled about. And so without further ado, here we go. Marvin Gaye, part three. We are entering a new a new phase here. Phase four, just hanging on for dear life, 1975 to 1984. Uh, 1976 brings us I Want You. And just to start things off contentiously, uh, I'm going to ask why I want you, David Ritz. Why a less urgent let's get it on? Why, why did it's, Marvin... It's not less urgent. I think it's... Uh, let's see. Don't compare. Don't compare. Don't compare. Don't compare, <laughs> David. Don't compare. Are you reminding I, yourself or are you telling me? No, <laughs> I'm talking to me because uh, I, do, <laughs> I, I do exactly what I tell people. Uh, I not love to do. it. Don't we all? I think I've probably listened to I Want You more than any other Marvin Gaye album. No shit. Why is so, that? The Tell- tracks. The, uh, you, you know, um, uh, uh, Dr. Dre um, had me over one time to his house because you know he's um thinking about doing uh, a uh, marvin gay movie and uh all he wanted to do was go to his studio and play with the tracks to i want you leon where and marvin were a match made in heaven the um, sensuality of the tracks the complexity of the tracks the uh the grooves uh the overdubs the harmonies it is it is it is and of course it's cocaine fueled which add which adds to it you know just as coleridge was high when he wrote his stuff i mean you is can't this, take is that this out your, of it. is this your favorite or the one you listen to the well, most well no 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 i mean again i mean i'm i'm i i really struggle not to be hierarchical but i think it is an enduring work of sensuous um 
musical art. And, yeah, I, and, I like this record a lot just on a musical level. Um, I just cannot stop. There's it. something I'm not hearing then. Yeah, so I, I think, um, you know, it's this is not really so much a song oriented record. Um, it's it's the grooves and the sound and, and the sweet. playing and the vibe. It's a real it's a vibe record. Um, yeah. You know, it's the you can right off the bat the disco kind of vibes are present, but he's got a kind of unique take on disco. He's got kind of like a dark kind of take on disco. Um, it's not like you know, it's not like you know, car wash. You know, it's not like that kind right, of style right. of disco. It's, disco it's a kind of more introspective kind of take on disco, and um, I really like all the playing and the sounds. And there's like great and, synth and stuff. And also, on it. if you go deep into it, you know, he's. Um, if you want to eat healthy and feel your best, I do. Uh, do I? Jesus, if, you should have seen what I ate for lunch. That was weird. My computer just. <laughs> Uh, went to if you want to eat healthy and do your best but if it must have seen if, inside my bowels <laughs> i know and it, but you know he's um discussing um cunny lingus for the i mean he's, he's he's no no but in a very he talks about his um hesitancy and his, I, I mean so it's 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 a very deep work of erotica and it's 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 by far his deepest work of uh, of. Uh, I feel like let's get it on as a boner, and this is a chubber. And I and <laughs> there's a number of records uh, throughout my whole life that I kept coming yeah. back to, thinking, I know I'm missing something here. And I remember for many 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 years, it was Public Image Limited's uh, Metal Box slash uh, Second Edition, um, and, and then I got it one day. And it just yeah. hasn't happened yet for me with I Want You. It seems it's like this is an album. Me. It seems like this is an album that musicians really like a lot. Mm -hmm. This seems like kind of a musician favorite. Um, it's like, you know, lots of ear candy on it. Some of the players on it, this is James Gadsden on drums. Fantastic. Um, Chuck Rainey on bass. Mm -hmm. You know, it's disco, but it's disco played by like these incredible I don't soul think and funk. It's, 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 it's disco hear, leaning. It's disco leaning. You know, I it, don't hear disco at, at, at all. I mean, listen to, to the... Um, song um soon i'll be loving you again of course after the you know after the that's a great song um, that's a great song there's dances. no there's no question and i'm gonna give you some head is the kind of message i can get behind soon i'll be well, loving you again is like a fusion you know it's like doo-wop a little bit of funk a little bit of like a disco element here and there that happens a great fusion of all his all his influences yeah that, that would that, that one i think inarguably great the whole record uh, as a whole i give it three and a quarter stars <laughs> i gave it four um, one thing I would wish was not there was all the sex noises. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, yeah. I, it, yeah, where they're kind of uh, the moaning and, moaning the, and groaning. <laughs> I, you know, as a period thing. That's a minor I, quibble. I, could I don't even care about that. That's, <laughs> it's a little bit Ohio playersy, but uh, but it's you know. It is what it is. I'm going to keep trying, and I, David, will report back to you once I crack I'll this I'll also nut. say for this right, that this one was... extremely this, gracious of you. <laughs> this, this record was uh, new to me. I was not really familiar with it at all, other than... Which the, one? Um, I Want You. Other than, I the, want you. Other than the title track. Yeah, I, yeah. I had not really... Um, the, the other deeper cuts I didn't really know in this record at all, so this was really fun to listen to and get into. Recorded October 76 to January 77, live at the London Palladium is a live double album by yeah. Notorious Stage Fright Affliction soul musician Marvin Gaye. Uh, so uh, this to me is more a more interesting and better live album. I'm not going to talk about the inner workings of it because uh, there's nothing except what I'm about to talk about that distinguishes it. Side four is a an 11 minute 53 second version of what became a single in 77, Got to Give It Up. Got to give it up is a is a really solid single of his. Um, I don't think it's the it's as great as uh, some of the early '70s singles he had, but because it always felt like a little bit sanitized, uh, Marvin to me, like uh, that scene in Willy Wonka where the uh, the car goes through the thing and gets all slickened up. Uh, I give it three stars. I give this one five. Really, I'm, I'm all for this one. Nice. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's just a party, you know. It's like the yeah. no, 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 but. Let me be very quick and say what you have to remember. It's autobiographical. It's about Marvin's fear of looking bad on the dance floor. He never liked to dance. Right, never right. To, um, shake his ass, and he's talking himself into it. So here he's now. That's here, interesting. Here he's actually trying to enter into the age of disco and have a disco hit, but he uses kind of disco genre to tell a personal story, and that. I find astounding that he's able to tell this little 
three minute, three, four minute short story about uh, one of his great anxieties as an entertainer, which is I don't look good on stage. I don't look good on wow, that's, it, that's interesting. So I had not Thank come you. from it uh, from that angle. And I appreciate you saying that because I know early on in his career that uh, he would, you know, a lot of his voice command came from him sitting while he was singing so it wouldn't be right. body reliant yeah. and he thought people would just be listening to him did right. he enter the age of disco a little bit horrified that that was irrefutable no, no 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 i don't think he had any attitude about disco and as a matter of fact i remember uh michael jackson's off the wall had come out when i was um with marvin on a on a tour he was he, he had a couple of dates in northern california and we um listened to off the wall together which is you know probably the best uh disco album that's ever been made and and he was crazy about it and i was crazy about it i so, love that how hierarchical that comment was <laughs> <laughs> yeah. got to give it up is just the it's just really funky it's just really got like and I, it's, it's strange and yeah. it's and it's and idiosyncratic it's um, yeah. before we leave um the um london album let me say one of the reasons um it sounds so good is that he overdu that he that he went back and redid a lot of his vocals in mm, the studio right it's a common live album ploy yeah it is, it is. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right very so, common ploy. all right so before we move on from got to give it up okay. I, it, this is a little bit of a side note but it was you know this uh the marvin gay's estate sued um the the uh right. the makers of blurred lines uh, the, uh, the the kind of cheap knockoff of it um, by what's his name there, Robin Thicke. It's, you listen to them back to back. They sound superficially so similar. They, they copied the arrangement almost exactly. But somehow the Blurred Lines one is utterly unfunky. <laughs> it's like completely <laughs> lacking any funk. It's It so mystifies me how the Marvin version just makes you want to dance and like the, how it's it's how ineffable uh, funk is, how hard it is to put your finger on. Why is one so funky? And the other one mm. that is so close that it lost <clears throat> a lawsuit. Yeah. <laughs> it's still not funky. <laughs> so. Uh, so so moving into 78, because I know, D David, you're just probably overflowing with stuff that you could say about this, but let me give a little context. <clears throat> First, I want to say that uh, when I met you, I, here's how I knew about you early in my life and I didn't grow up with the internet um, <clears throat> I found Hear My Dear and that album blew me away I must have been 14 15 years old it blew me the fuck away so uh, when I met you it was just with excitement that I met somebody else that felt similarly about this record so uh, Anna, Anna Gordy, uh, Anna Gordy Gay, uh, at this point, uh, has sued, uh, Marvin for divorce. Uh, there's all this drawn out, uh, court thing that happens. And, <clears throat> um, so the singer's attorney wants to end things swiftly and convinces, uh, Marvin to give up half of the percentage of album royalties from his next album. So, uh, the gay's divorce is finalized in June. Uh, he's about to start uh, work on the record and said he, f he figures he'll do a quickie record, nothing heavy, nothing even good, stating why should I break my neck when Anna was going to wind up with the money anyway. And here is why Marvin Gaye is an artist. Because, I mean, and this is like irrefutable, because he not only at some point in, in this tale <clears throat> starts to see this as... Uh, you know, in like an inevitable exercise in which he'll have to completely come clean as a human being, but it becomes his only double studio album. He did not, he, he goes above and beyond, certainly did not have to. Uh, certainly his gut, his, you know, warring spouse gut is telling him not to. Um, and everything about this album is like a holy shit, what the fuck corner of, of rock and funk history. Uh, right on the front cover is a painting of Marvin dressed in a toga in Roman, in a sort of Roman setting. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the back covers features a temple with the word matrimony collapsing around uh, a sculpture of a romantic couple. Uh, the word judgment is on it. Uh, hands extended across a Monopoly board. Uh, the scales of justice sit above the game of Monopoly. Uh, I mean, this thing is just, and the music is completely amazing. David, tell us, 
about this record and tell us how you enter into the story because of the record. Well, I entered into the story because I heard it and I had your reaction to it. I thought it was it was absolutely brilliant and um, literary, you know, <laughs> and uh, I compared it to Bergman's um, Scenes of a Marriage. Absolutely. I mean, was, yeah. I mean, it, and, and so I wrote a letter to the L.A. Times um, who had attacked it and called it um, who cares? It's personal. No one cares about Marvin stuff. And I said, you know, I compared it to Duke Ellington and Charlie Mingus and Stevie Wonder and said it's a major work of the imagination. And Marvin read the letter that I had written, which was in part written. So he would read the letter and invite me to his studio, which he did. And that's how we got together. And and um uh you know i can, think can i it, say real quick also yeah. it is the most honest album about divorce yeah. of all time now here's why i think that because most people are thinking well what the fuck about blood on the tracks and yeah. i'm going to argue that all the the uh the initial sessions for blood on the tracks would have been just as honest an album as this but bob had time to let it uh, stew and kick around during christmas holiday of 74 so when he recut this stuff he did it with venom and vile uh this is a little bit different than blood on the tracks because yeah, i yeah. feel like with blood on the tracks dylan's being pretty honest and being pretty confessional by his own standards but dylan's always kind of wearing a mask there's True. no there is no, there's mask no mask on marvin's all. face in this album I mean, even there's even parts of it where He's being kind of self-serving in a way that almost ad acknowledges that he's being self-serving. <laughs> it's kind of almost the, like on the opening track, for instance, you know, he, he's kind of almost like sarcastically, you know, making the announcement that this album is for you, baby. And, you know, and it's uh, that in itself has its own kind of real honesty to so it. So the opening lyric is, uh, and this is spoke, a spoken intro, I guess I'll have to say this album is dedicated to you, although perhaps I may not be happy. This is what you want. So I've conceded. I hope it makes you happy. There's a lot of truth in it, babe. See, that ain't on the tracks that's another no, level no, that's, beyond that's almost <laughs> private press <laughs> level and this is like a superstar doing a double album at the height of disco yeah. um and also i think just as um holy holy is probably the highlight in a certain way of um what's going on where he you know screams um but but certainly to me the emotional high point of this is anna's song where he screams mm -hmm name anna because and and in that regard um he still she has always been his motivator when he didn't want to go to work he told him to go to work because she's a gordy and she had a work ethic and he didn't have that work ethic and he and 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 she pushed him and pushed him and pushed him and now that they have separated and he's had two children with another woman to, uh uh who is um 18 years younger than Marvin and maybe 30 years or more um, younger than Anna, he still, he, he, he is still crying to Anna, I need you to motivate me. And in that regard, I think um, it did you is. Get the, did you get the vibe that he was still in love with her? Yes. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and, uh, or, or was just tied to her. And of course, at the yeah. end of his life, he did go to Anna when he was going crazy and 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 he did seek um solace uh for Rummer. So so um Anna um her his mom and Jan are you know certainly the three most important characters um in his life and just as Jan helped inspire let's get it on it's An it, it it is Anna who 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 is somehow able to bring out um, the kind of deepest Marvin um, there is. And also its um, narrative structure is so intriguing. I mean, how he's going back and forth. There's also, and then I'll be quiet, songs like, like Anger, mm -hmm. which is, it, it tells you, you know, anger will make you, sick children yeah key track um, anger will um dis destroy me where he's talking to himself he he's talking him 
itself out of going crazy. He's talking. So it's it's and, and you, you know, know what I love about that song is the way that it fades into existence as if it's yeah. an ever present emotion. Yeah, and, and it's turbulent. And, yeah, the fading exactly. does have that effect in it general. Does, yeah. Like the song has always been going. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I feel, I wind up feeling really bad for him when I hear that song fading in. I love the magic of um, I met a little girl, kind mm-hmm. of a retro soul thing. Um, but it, it like recalls that you know that '60s when they met and when it all began. 1964 <laughs> really like yeah, really yeah. takes you back there that song sounds like there's a lot of regret in it you know that, that song that, you know, and 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 also the other thing about marvin that which is sort of makes him a great artist is that his particular brand of melancholy has a lyrical beauty to it i mean marvin is a guy who would create situations in his life that would make him miserable intentionally so he would be inspired to write right 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 he's a true artist i mean he really is a true artist and this this album is uh there's no better underscoring of that of that notion i think this album's total lack of any pretense the only concession to any kind of commerciality is the fact that that the lines rhyme uh, because a line like what I can't understand is if you love me, how could you turn me into the police? Uh, that's not really, yeah, that's not trying to get a hit single anymore. <laughs> you, can, you, you can see why it it failed commercially. Yeah. You can see why, especially coming after he had made let's get it on and then got to yeah. give it up. These kind of very crowd pleasing kind of things. You, th- this record's a lot to take in. You know, yeah. it's, it's a lot. It, it asks a lot of you. It gives you a lot, but it asks you a lot. You know, it's kind of a bummer. <laughs> it's like it's and yeah. this and and you know a great bummer record. Like it's some like I mean I love like Neil Young on the beach. You know, yeah, a, yeah. One, one of my favorite records yeah. ever. I love well, records like this. Yeah. But, I don't mean that in a negative way. But it's no, you know, no. it's it's a I mood. would only add, and this is true about art for me, I am inspired by true art, whether yeah. it's whether it's sort of a bummer or not. Right, I mean me I too. see uh, raging bull is a bummer of a movie you could say in a sense but that movie inspires me because it's so true and and that makes me feel good i mean it makes me feel good it makes me feel connected to humanity (laughs) yeah that art can be strong and brave and it doesn't have to have goopy happy endings and it doesn't have to be a formulaic and that's why i think here my dear and by the way i think it has I mean, I hear about it from people all the time now, whereas I would say 20 years ago, it was, you know, me and 43 other people like the album, but it's definitely, I think, been uh, resurrected. And yeah, has- for sure. The, the, fun, the, the funniest thing to me about how depressing it is, is yeah. this is a double album of a lot of one thing. And, um, you know, the, the way that it's structured is brilliant because side one and side two are just like one after a, another just being punched in the face with honesty and then yeah. side three is the sort of jazzy fantasia uh stoner side where you kind of yeah. get out into the universe and right. then side four after a funky space reincarnation brings it down for a, a landing on planet earth again but falling in love again is now his life had gotten so f- messy that the happy ending yeah had right. already collapsed on him sounds it om- sounds ominous <laughs> yeah like his happy ending his falling in love again had already died before the album came out so um yet it's a beautiful song and it's amazing that yeah that it's, ama- it's amazing all the time and and gives me um hope um and um I would also say if we're going to jump in, are are we going to jump into in our uh, lifetime? We'll wrap it up this one. Uh, no, uh, uh, in, uh, a couple we more have notes. A couple on things this. Uh, left befi- besides in our. Well, life. before we move on from here, my dear, you know this is another one where the the where this is probably the 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 clearest example of where he's using the technique of through composing. Through, yeah, yeah. So these songs are you know not the, most of them are not verse chorus verse kind of songs. Um, it, it makes it for um, a, a little bit of a more challenging listen. You kind of got to like, there's totally. the, it's, it's not a lot of like, it, it, you have to kind of put the work in um, to really kind of follow the melodies, but very ambitious. Um, you could tell he was obviously really inspired once he started teasing out these songs mm-hmm. and re- realized he had a lot to say. So it justifies its double album Absolutely. length. Um, anyway, I give this four and a half stars and I love it. I give it a hard five. David does too. I know that for a fact. <laughs> 
I, the, one, the one, my least favorite thing on it is probably Funky Space Reincarnation. I, I'd love that. It's his take on P-Funk, It's obviously. his take on P-Funk, yeah. but it, that seems a little bit less, it's slightly like a little bit less cool than the rest of the record. But yeah, it doesn't kind of live up to its, uh, what I'd hoped it was going to be when I heard the description of it. But still, amazing record. Um, yeah. So good. I will also say, Time to Get Together, greatest lyric possibly of all time, uh -huh. uh, delivered during a, uh, David knows where I'm going with this, delivered during a mid-song rap-like confessional breakdown. I've been racing against time, trying my best to find my way, change our world in just one day, blowing coke all up my nose, getting in and out my clothes, fooling around with midnight hoes, but that chapter of life's closed. If that's not wishful thinking, I don't know what what is. <laughs> uh, unfortunately for him, funky uh, space reincarnation was that the one that you weren't the crazy about? Is that that's that's kind of the yeah that that one to me yeah. I wasn't well, as crazy yeah. about. I don't. Uh, all I would say about that, you know, it's a song about an orgy, and I know of no other literary work that handles that subject with such kind of um delicacy and grace mm -hmm. right all of my orgies were very delicate and great. Metaphorically <laughs> in space. I, I, I don't know. So that record tanks, unfortunately. Yes. And, uh, I think, definitely I think one of the most interesting and fascinating records in music history, however. So definitely seek it out on... Uh, the whole thing's going to be in our playlist. Uh, pretty right? much, or yeah. Pretty much all of it. But So it kind of sends him into not a great place when it bombs. Right. right. He didn't so, really react super well to that. For, first, he's pulled into doing uh, Pops We Love You, a tribute to Father, which is a single uh, with Diana Ross, Smokey Ross, Robinson and Stevie Wonder uh, for Barry Gordy's dad um, after he'd passed away. Uh, the uh, Our guest tonight, David Ritz, writing in his own book, uh, said that they formed a spirited quartet and that the song was infectious, uh, noting that Marvin had boundless love for Pops Gordy. Uh, do you, are you still a fan of the song? Yeah, I, 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 I'm intrigued by the song. I'm intrigued how Marvin finds his way into it because there's there isn't a lot of space so he kind of growls and it's it's yeah i i think it's a great kind of disco-y improbably um enjoyable uh so i actually like the way everybody finds their place in that song but 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 this, but this one doesn't really uh, pull me one way or the other. I'll give yeah. it two stars, Joe. What about? I give it about the same. It's some, it's um, I do like his performance on it. That's kind of the uh, everybody sounds pretty good on it. It's a little bit like a song that like you would write for L. Ron Hubbard or something, <laughs> kind of like yeah. hero worship kind of song. It's a little mm -hmm. bit like I guess it's cool. I don't so know. let's let's talk. It's a, about, it's a minor kind of release. Let, let's let's talk about time. ego tripping out. That's 1979. Ego tripping out comes out as a single. Uh, the record is originally meant to be the. Lead Lead single for uh, the aborted Love Man record, which we'll get to in a second. Um, however, as the record was scrapped and reworked into In Our Lifetime, um, this one received some further work and then was omitted from the final album track list. Uh, this is uh, a bizarre one for me. This I, couldn't make like heads a, of, I couldn't make heads or tails of this, this one This feels either. like a fucking Weird Al song or something. It Do is, Dr. Demento? Yeah, his vocal sounds kind of half jokey and the synths sound farty. So it's a, no, it's a no thanks guys. for me. Can't even guys. tell if he's serious. I give it one star, and that's being generous. Guys, <laughs> moving tripping out. Yeah, it's, I like I like the De La Soul song. It is one of it. It is. What uh, am I missing here? Are you sending me a text about this? <laughs> this is a, a seminal Marvin Gaye. This is about the dis. This is about. Who's he the, making fun of at first? This is about the destructive property of ego. So this is a self-deprecating kind of thing. I'll be right. brief. He begins by creating a character who he told people was um, Teddy Pendergrass, but it's actually him, uh, an artist who has a lot of money and, and a lot of clothes and his and his ego um, tripping out. But then as the song evolves, you get to the line that says, Spread the news, only here to deepen my soul. It ain't about the money. Turn the fear into energy, cause the toot and the smoke won't fulfill the need. Only one way, one way. It's a prayer. Yeah. It's, it's, it's his prayer to release him from the prison of ego. I, I, I just, 
I love this song. And, Do you and, think this and, is a reaction to, you know, I mean, it must be to the, the failure of Here, My Dear. This is him kind of... It's just a, a Marvin Gaye meditation. Mm-hmm. I don't... I, this one... To, and, and I swear, David, I went back and it just didn't strike me in a way that pulled out any feels that I could connect well, with. I'm going to listen again now. Yeah. Right, I'm going to try again. Wait, I'm going to listen right now, David. Hold on for five <laughs> minutes, okay? All right. Anyway, All right. this is uh, kind of a prelude to uh, the next yeah. record. So, so, well, let's let's talk about Love Man first. Right. Okay, so let me give some historical context here. So, uh, Ego Tripping Out is supposed to be the, uh, the lead track off of a disco-styled album called Love Man. This is, uh, from everything that I've researched, it seems like this is his low point um, uh, in his life, is right around this time, as far as how complexly bad things are going on with things. But, um, so he's uh, super in debt to the IRS to the tune of four and a half million dollars. He goes out on this, like, I kind of don't give a shit world tour to just to alleviate his debt, but he's not into it, so he runs away in Japan. Um, is that right? No, no, he, no, 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 not in Japan. Hawaii. In, that's yeah. right, Hawaii. Um, he had had a, a show in Japan. Uh, and he just he hides out, right? He, he secludes himself in a bread van uh, in Maui. Uh, while he's like doing insane amounts of coke, he's hitting up all of his his family members and old acquaintances, including Smokey, who Smokey actually grappled with with crack at the end of the '80s, but his time didn't come yet. He didn't get it. So Marvin did get, didn't get any money. He has an ill-fated reunion with Jan around this time, where he points a knife at her heart, which does not go well. He told you. I'd given up. The problems were too big for me. I just wanted to be left alone and blow my brains out right. on high octane toot. It would be a slow but relatively pleasant death, certainly less messy than a gun. So he ingests a full ounce of cocaine, which I found out on the way over here was eight eight balls. Because I don't really, I don't like coke. Um, so that's not good. Well, but just to recontextual. Lies it a bit um, here, my dear, is a commercial failure. He's broke, so he's going to do the most commercial album possible. Just do a party album. Call it Love Man. Resurrect Marvin as a sex guy. He can't live with that idea. The artist in him re 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 revolt against it. And he takes those initial tracks, which were had party lyrics to them, and instead does another deep metaphysical sort of dive into his um, psyche. And so that the album we get, which but, we but, out- but just previous to him actually recording this, he winds up in London and discovers freebasing. And this is yeah. this is where things turn, right? Because things get really dark for him. Yeah. And that's where he decides, well, the reason that um, I'm freebasing, besides the fact that it gets you incredibly high, is that um, I can't live with this idea of this outmoded sex god guy because I'm just holed up in a room trying to kill myself but also you have to add into that and it it explains why in our lifetime is called in our lifetime is because he also reverts to his uh to his kind of evangelical christian um childhood notions of these are the end times and the world is coming to an end and so in our lifetime uh, refers to the fact that the world will be destroyed in our lifetime. And so praise and life is for learning and love party and far cry and heavy love affair in our lifetime become uh, metaphysical uh, musings. And it's of enormous interest. Now, because Motown issued the album before he approved it, he was still working right, on it. Right. Song, he kind of disowned the album and ultimately quit. There, there are a couple of things that sound like they're scratch vocals that sound yeah. like that, 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 that right, right. unfinished. And, and there are a couple of scratch vocals on it, and it is sketchy in a kind of a um, literal way. But the album cover, Marvin personally um, 
um, sort of um, dictated to an artist, he told him what to draw, is of the two Marvin Gaye's, the angel and the devil Mm -hmm. encountering one another in chairs opposing one another, which is where I got the title Divided Soul for my book, because there is no clearer um, work in, in terms of understanding Understanding how tormented Marvin was and how divided he was. Oh, you're not going to like us after this. All right. So before we before we, uh, <laughs> before we talk about the record itself, you know, I never really thought of this, but um, there's there's some parallels with Marvin and D'Angelo as being like yeah. this, like you're the sex god, and then you're forced to sort of be this thing. And I think it was a lot for D'Angelo to deal with too. I think yeah. that kind of like led to him being out of the picture, out of the public eye for so long. Right. You know, when he, he did the video for Untitled, you know, and it, it's like that he just became just that. And for these people who are so talented, who have these like abundant amounts of like, I got the impression that he put on weight on purpose. Yeah, I mean, these people have like abundant amounts of genius, like you know, like like off the charts levels of genius. And to be pigeonholed as you're like the sex guy, it's got to mm-hmm. be a real drag. Yeah, <laughs> but really, I really, I got to say, David, you know, in all yeah. in all seriousness, and I knew coming into this about your passion for this record, and I I really don't hear it. Um, I don't all hear. Right. It didn't. I. I mean, not that I just disagree, but you know, when I'm when I heard it, it it just felt like um, uh, his ideas weren't connecting in a way that had me on board with them. I mean, my easily uh, my the the two for me that stand out are "Life Is for Learning." Um, you know, I love that song and "Far Cry," uh, which is uh, I know this is really where. Th- things hinged on Far Cry, right? Yeah. Far Cry is the one that's really like he's sort of just sort of mumbling, kind of a scratch vocal. But the funny the, thing the is, the track is really interesting. So though. well, yeah. Well, the track is really interesting. So it, they, it almost would have been better as an instrumental. But his, or something I think his his vocal contributions uh, they work. It's it's it's, it's, it's funny. A, it's, I think it works. <laughs> that, that one was that one felt uncomfortable to me. It felt like they put really. It, oh, it okay. felt like really they put it out against his wishes. Like he right, wouldn't have right. wanted that vocal on it. Um, li- listening to that's you know that I I I don't know if I'm correct about that. It seems like that was probably the main one that he had the bone of contention about. My only point about um, in our lifetime is that if you're to understand the complexity of Marvin Gaye, this is an album you cannot ignore, regardless of the um, scratch vocals and everything else and its incompleteness. It's like here, my dear, and he puts it in that he puts it all on the line. His theological confusion, his emotional confusion is all in this album. And um, I guess we're going to jump to Midnight Love. Look, I just want to say before we do that uh, I just can't. There will always be something that doesn't sit right with me about this record that I've missed something. So I think for me, for me, it's um, David night or day. Whenever I do come to the understanding that I've missed something and I and (laughs) it clicks, I'm going to call you. I'm not going to text. I have called. Listen, I do. I do that all the time. But my, my my only point was going to be that this is his. This is his last effort to make a cohesive concept out. Right. Yeah, this right. is kind of the last of the confessional uh, ones. This right. is this is his last kind I of mean, confessional statement. Midnight Midnight Love is is uh for all that I love about it. Um It's a collection not, of songs. But exactly, but the, the great exactly. thing about Midnight Love as a piece. Yeah. Um it, oh by the way, we didn't rate Midnight in our lifetime. In our lifetime yeah. Um I I gave it one and a half stars. I gave it two. Okay. Um. I, and I will say the thing I, I I do see the point of like if you I think and I think you're right if you do want to understand his full development as a person and an artist I think you know lyrically concept wise and what he's saying I think that's all important as a musician this one doesn't seem to connect to me it doesn't seem to have the same kind of focus yeah. it seems kind of a little overly busy to me it didn't yeah, really yeah. didn't ma- make me want to shake my booty as much <laughs> so, right. um, I anyway. also think he was very cognizant of trying to capture an audience again yeah especially after hear my dear and who can fault the guy but I'm a fucking nerd. I love the idea that this is a superstar who I feel like I have a one-on-one connection with because here my dear so obscure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so for something like this, it's less interesting, I think, inherently. Well, but, and, and again, I don't want to be labor the point, uh, Dave, but I believe just the opposite is true. I think Marvin, with if he had been... If he had completed in our lifetime, it would have been... He gave up all 
notions of commerce. He was totally interested in ex- in expressing um, his heart and his confusion. And there was no attempt to be commercial at all. Then a total That's misread how- on my part, because at this at this point, you're in his in, you're one of his yeah, one of circle. his good friends. Yeah. 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 So obviously yeah. I'm wrong about that. So well, going to the next one. Oh, Midnight or am I or am I right? Because I read it somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> did you read, it on, did you read it on the I, internet? I, I, yeah, on the interwebs, did. it was okay. there. Um, so so the, the sonic foot, the sonic fingerprint of the next record, Midnight Love, is instantly um, a very different kind of thing. But it, before the record is the song, right? The song. Right. Be, so uh, Midnight Love is not a record yet. Is that correct, David? Right. Right. So there, you, so you go over. To right. Belgium in April right. 1982. There's no record. Uh, right. There's just he's just out there. What the hell happens out there? Well, there's a, there's there's um, I go over his apartment. There's a, we watch a the uh, documentary on TV on John Coltrane. We watch it. We turn it off. Um, he puts on a track that has been written by his keyboardist Odell Brown. There's a coffee table book um which kind of uh, shows i forgot the name of the for wrench cartoonist but under the guise of hip art it's sort of basically s and m mm-hmm. uh showing women being uh violated in various ways and uh though, though you know it's an art book um it's not porn um and i just look at it and uh he looks at me and he says what do you think and i said i think you need uh the actual um, healing and he said what does that mean and I said well you know you find a woman that you love and you give her pleasure and she gives you pleasure and you're healed of all the wounds of the past and he said well that's very interesting why don't you just write a poem about that so I just took the yellow pad and wrote when blue you know I wrote something in five minutes or six minutes and gave it to him and the the, the, the word seemed to have a, a sort of a notes on them and he wrote a melody to the words that went with the right track. there right there in front of you or yeah yeah and yeah. and and he had what's to the, what's the probable length of time this is all transpiring with maybe 20 minutes okay and 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 he ping-ponged he uh he had two boom boxes and one had the track and the other one he put on his vocal so he could sing to the track and um it was done and um later on after i was gone he added a bridge and uh put some words on the bridge which uh, don't make a lot of um sense if you ever listen to the bridge <laughs> but by that point it didn't really make any um difference and um and so the of course the odd part of it is i'm a ghost writer by trade my main work is to is to channel voices of other people um and I basically ghost wrote it for him. I mean, I wrote a script that I thought was um, applicable. Well, so this is weird Marvin because you, you didn't just ghost write it. I mean, you wrote it with him. Uh, you know, the yeah. odd look. The odd thing to me is, you know, keeping in mind what what was all that nonsense. I don't know if you were legally allowed to talk about this, but <laughs> all the nonsense with the contention about the authorship credits. You well, were obviously see, yeah. there, and that no, obviously no, no, no. Happened. I can I can talk about it because it all got. Was re- that a text from your attorney? No, <laughs> I, 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 I can't turn off the, the, the it's deal. Okay, it's, I have to keep going right. attached to do it. So it's my attorney attention. says, "Open your mouth and your life." <laughs> uh, the, your ass will follow. <laughs> there was no real contention. I mean, there was contention, but once the estate, I mean, I didn't want to sue. Uh, here's what happened: the album comes out, and Marvin on the album writes, "Thanks to David Ritz's brilliant literary mind for the title sexual healing and i kind of think oh yeah, I mean, and that is some credit by the way it's and, emblazoned yeah, and, nice and, and big there right and i think oh great uh he's going to give me some money for the song and i've never written a song before and so uh, as time goes on he gets tired of me calling him and he knows i'm going for money and so finally i call my friend jerry uh wexler who you know was a producer and a sort of a rabbi and mentor of mine i asked him what to do and he says sue him sue him so i sued marvin um he was killed before the lawsuit was resolved his is is his his estate um continued uh to um engage with my attorneys but, but once they saw 
that I had a tape of us writing the song together, they said, of course, you were, and we resolved the dispute, and I'm listed as one of the three songs. And the amazing on. thing is, you have written songs since then, but yeah. I'm sure you'll be the first to say that you, it is not the Nothing, fir- no, no, front no, and center I mean, thing that you do, but... Listen. You know, you come along. This is one of the funny things about life, right? I'm sure you've played this over in your head two, three times since your encounter with Marvin. (laughs) So, so, you know, here you are trying to put together, you know, the life and plans of David Ritz. And this thing falls in your lap. And not only do you rise to the occasion, but here's a guy who's been struggling his entire life with trying to find some semblance of peace with this thing in his life and you very very swiftly put a uh put some words to it and allow him you of course you guys don't know this at the time but allow allow him to in a sense put this to bed at least momentarily at least on wax uh before he passes and that's an amazing thing to have taken part in yeah but the ironies is ironies and ironies and ironies it's also the song that let him come home and coming home led to his demise and right, right. Um, uh you know there's a million ways to look at it. and of course you know i have thought about it two million or three million times and it impacted my life of course the irony of irony the ironies is i thought i was writing the song about him but i was really writing it about me because i had to go through my own sex addiction and my own recovery and so on and so forth so um it's um um but what a masterful intersection of two life paths at that particular moment in time well i appreciate that and um um and 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 i'm you know i'm honored i mean i'm 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 honored that he let me hang out with him i'm honored that he let me come come over there to europe and ask a million questions about his life i'm 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 you know i always felt like because at the time you have to understand also i didn't i had to borrow money to pay the house note and i my career was not in great shape and i needed a gig and when marvin said come to europe i got on a plane and went you know i had two little kids and a wife and uh, and and i was crazy i mean and and this goes back to my discussing in our lifetime and the song i mean i am crazy for marvin gay in a way that's inordinate i mean i am yeah. crazy for his literary musical philosophical theological blah 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 outlook and so that i was willing to drop everything because it was as though uh mozart was um telling me that i could hang out with him yeah there wasn't anything i was i wouldn't do to sort of be with marvin and learn more about him even even when he was in this um uh state of um sort of uh despair as great as the song is, and it is, I think, is, you know, in, indubitably a, a complete classic, it's also an extremely clear way forward for him to be successful well into the 80s and far into the future. Yeah, it's I think like the he, template's it's, there. It, it's like he yeah. jumped 10 years into the future or something. Right, it's like, right. you know, And I think, uh, you know, I the the technique of him writing on this, um, he, he had acquired a role in 808. And so a lot of these songs, I think pretty much every song on the record, the drums are that 808. And that right. kind of allowed him to sort of build the tracks and make the, I don't know if he did, did the literal drum programming. I'm guessing he probably did. But um, it kind of allowed for him to kind of have more control and to kind of build these things like tracks, not so much like, you know, kind of more overdub at a time right. kind of way of doing it. Instantly, he's on the same turf now as Michael and Prince and Rick James and those guys. He sounds like immediately contemporary in a way that he didn't really so much like a year or two before. It's like he like takes a big leap into the future. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it buries all of his old kind of tropes. It's it's a whole kind of new way of working for him. In that context, I find this album really super impressive. How he was able to just incorporate all this and kind of synthesize a new sound that's th- so like fully realized. This is know? like the way he's been working now for quite some time. Is he ha- just like with uh, what's going on. He c- comes up with this song. It's a template for the record. Then he makes the record. So for this, sexual healing is, is the template. Uh, I don't feel like... Um, like most of the reg- rest of the record measures up to sexual healing, but that's not surprising. I do the think- only thing, um, let me just uh, say, the only yeah. song I return to over and over again on Til that tomorrow. album. Till Tomorrow. No. Though I think Till Tomorrow is a heartfelt bu- 
uh, um, Alid. But I think uh, Rocking After Midnight, which has some aspects of I Want You in it, is a multi-track kind of dance song. That's interesting. That feels like a kind of by rote party banger to me. Maybe I need to go back to that one. I say I love the blend of like the 808s and the sort of 70s funk elements, like the Uh horns and the guitars. That's like a cool blend to me. Yeah. Yeah, that kind of uh, funky chicken gu- guitar lick that's uh, played by his, at the time, brother-in-law Gordon mm-hmm. and, uh, Angst, and also the way the um, the uh, um, tenor um, sax comes in. He sort of mixes it in at the very uh, last minute or minute and a half of the song. It's a uh, masterful um, kind of... Uh, dance track and it's a very extravagant Marvin Gaye overdubs and and um self um harmonies and I've listened to that a lot and 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 that's that's about it for that album for me. Well, I yeah, like I, I like, I like the, Midnight Lady. Yeah, I like the opener a lot Midnight Lady. Yeah, I was yeah. just going to say that's it's like the it's that just has a great like bright and punchy kind of sound to it right when yeah. it kicks in. I like the chord yeah. change. Um That's a big Rick James thing. Yeah, that right. One. Yeah, I I like this album. This album to me, um, you know, I've I've kind of known this one a long time. I've always kind of been familiar with this, and I've had this on vinyl for many years. Like this one, four stars, and I quite like I it. I give it three stars. Mm-hmm. David gives it five. <laughs> um, also, okay. should mention uh, till tomorrow. We kind of you mentioned it briefly, yeah. but um, it's a great that's song. got that's like you know like like doo wop, but like it's by by, by way of yeah. craft work or something. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's like a, he's listening to a lot of that stuff. Yeah, that I know, yeah. I know. You can you can really hear that kind of influence. I love you know he's he's a a pretty underrated uh, cool like synth guy <laughs> he's yeah. really no, he's cool stuff with synth i want to say i want to say by this time he was you know marvin is is not doing that well he actually uh in a sort of half-hearted manner attempted suicide uh you know pretty cl- four days before his death right yeah yeah he um he um, threw himself out of a speeding bar. sports car yeah um so i'm coming out of the game with my pal ed Eckstein and uh comes on the radio that Marvin Gaye has been shot. It, it looks like it's his father who uh, shot him. I was um, shocked, but then I thought about it and thought about it and thought about it. And I said, oh, I see. That's how he wants, that's how he's going to get out of here. And my first thought was that he had somehow manipulated his father into killing him. Now, I didn't know that he had actually given his father the gun, the gun right, and right. I didn't know that he had yeah on christmas day 83 he had um assaulted his dad and beaten his dad up and right. his dad re- responded by shooting him but it did seem to me and i still believe to this day that marvin um arranged a suicide uh, uh, uh that he uh Range. He, he, told, he told his brother, I got what I wanted. I couldn't do it myself, so I had him do it. It's good. I ran my race. There's no more left in me. Yeah, and, and also it achieved a couple of uh, things that in his, first of all, he got out of here and he really did want it. He was so filled with uh, self disgust that um, he couldn't tolerate him, uh, himself anymore. But he also, in his, in the, in his 14 year old, um, child's mind of an evangelical pentecostal christian he thought to himself if my father uh if i get my father to murder him he will not only uh uh rot in hell my mother will finally leave him which he did and which marvin had been trying to get her to do for years so it's also there- useful to know that you know around this time apparently uh marvin gay was often suicidal and paranoid and yeah. was afraid of leaving his room and and talked about very little besides suicide and death yeah um and 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 um all i want to say about the album uh vulnerable which um so this is so so there's three posthumous records that come out after his passing um uh first of all do you find that there's anything of value on um on any of them well i think romantically yours is interesting Uh, listen everything's interesting like i go back i'm interested in everything every time marvin Gaye went into the studio it's interesting to me of the three vulnerable which is um the standards that he had been singing for nearly 20 years he had these um charts by uh Bo- abby scott uh, who's a great orchestra 
writer who wrote also wrote he ain't heavy he's my brother on uh, taste of uh, honey and wrote these charts and in the beginning marvin before marvin learned to overdub himself with what's going on he began to sing these songs in the um 60s once he learned to overdub himself he did new versions of these standards mm -hmm. and i think they're among his greatest work um he wanted to be for Frank Sinatra, Nat King Cole. The irony is that as great as Nat Cole was and as great as Frank Sinatra was, they could have never achieved this kind of interpretive, multi-layered um, work that Marvin did with um, standards. It's it's it's. Yeah, there 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 are some some, in some interesting parallels with Sinatra's conceptual work yeah. uh, that are kind of intriguing if you look at it, but. Uh, yeah. Marvin Marvin passed away unfortunately the day before his forty fifth birthday. David had it had to have been uh, you know real hard hitting for you. Um, you know I can only imagine you know your impact on his life is uh, you know uh, rippling through time and space, and uh, your work uh, continues to be uh, for the ages all of your written work. Thank you, so, thank you so much for for joining us. My pleasure, us. guys. I appreciate. Um, what do you, you get? What do you give this episode? <laughs> uh, uh, let's see. Let me turn off the clock. It's two thousand one hundred and forty-five dollars. <laughs> but I mean, that's cheap. David, okay, I, guys. I, 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 lo um, I love you, man. Okay, and, and and also, if you kind of need me to, you know, uh, fill in some holes, you can call me again. We can add okay. on. Oh, if the, if okay, that's your I, idea of a come on, I'm all, I'm up for it. Even though I'm a happily married man, it was really, you, really a pleasure talk. talking to you, David. Thank oh, you so much okay. for doing this. Enjoyed it much. So of course, there's the requisite slew of posthumous records milking the cow as the cow is desiccated at six feet under. Now, some of these are, uh, this is kind of a uh, uh, somewhat interesting remainder, what they got left. There's, there's, there's some stuff. Yeah, there's. <laughs> <laughs> so the first one's Dream of a Lifetime, which is the most hodgepodgey of the three. Right. So it's, it includes the top five R&B single Sac Sanctified Lady, right? Originally known as Sanctified P-Word. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Sanctified Pissy, except not Pissy. Um, so uh, there, there was going to be... Uh, I think it's it's odd, you know. Even though we did sexual healing, he was still coming out with all these, you know, still these sort of like. Well, uh, he, there was some more banger. Yeah, there were some more sessions after Midnight Love where he's still kind of basing things with the 808 uh, drum machine, and um, so Sanctified Lady is one of those kind of like a it's he. The, <laughs> there's kind of a turn to like Robo Funk. <laughs> there's a, there's a mm. few of these. On the Dream of a Lifetime comp that are kind of in that, um, you know, robo 80s, you know, uh, there's some like, you know, vocoder and stuff going on. Um, a hint at an interesting direction, sort of, but um, these, the, the 808. Vaguely, vaguely interesting. Yeah, the, 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 the one that, you know. I, these all it, seem kind of unfinished, the, the ones from the post Midnight Love era. They seem like. Look, a, there's, there's, there's two songs on this that are of any interest whatsoever, I think. Well, there's a, bu there's there's a, a bunch of them from the 70s. There's a song from 71 called. It's Madness, uh, which was uh, reworked with modern drum programming, uh, which actually is very interesting. That one, that's uh, a very good song. That's yeah, a very that good one, song. That one I kind of love. Um, uh, this was actually uh, was a recorded for, as a demo for Sammy Davis Jr. And then, ain't it funny how things turn around? I think is is a really good song. That one's weird because it's like they that one it was from the Hear My Dear era, right? So right. it was done in the seventies, but then they kind of tried to like modernize it. So there's yeah. like eight oh eight hand claps and stuff, and like real eighties kind of sounding stuff. That's kind of a weird hybrid. There's a Bootsy Collins remix of the song, which is <laughs> right. really bizarre. Um, uh, there, there's I, also I know, there's, um, you know there's another one called Symphony that's a Let's Get It On mm -hmm. outtake. Um, Another one where they put like weird drum machine stuff. But they probably would have been better if they just put out the original mix. Um, I think ultimately this is a cash grab piece of shit. Uh, there's one good song and one great one. I give it one and a half stars. I, I gave it two. I mean, yeah, it's in that zone. It's, yeah. You know, and it's, so um, in eighty, I mean, do you really want to talk about this pile of turds anymore? There's two <laughs> that, songs. That seems I like, like enough. <laughs> there's a song called "Savage in the Sack," which uh, that one's pretty which bad. David Ritz, uh, you know, 
says basically there's, there's absolutely no way he would ever want this or sanction this on a record. Mm-hmm. Um, so in 85, Romantically Yours comes out. That's the second of three posthumous records. Um, so so again, this is kind of a half and half kind of scenario where, um, so he's singing stuff this like... Is, this is a little over six months later, by yeah. the way. He's singing like, uh, so there's a bunch of stuff from 1968. He was making a record that, where he's kind of doing like Great American Songbook kind of tunes, like kind of crooner stuff. Record that kind of like got fly me to the moon, yeah, you know, that kind um, of stuff. Kind of more um, unreleased. Uh, he kind of abandoned the project, so that's side one is kind of all that stuff. It's all you know, decent. He sings everything. He actually amazing. stopped uh, re- midway through recording. Uh, Gay was uh, depressed over s- whatever some unspecified personal issues, and um, he was also upset over his career. He stopped recording sessions. So anyway, so there's that's kind of a bulk of it comes from that. And those are kind of okay. The songs that are of interest are the ones that he um, did in the 70s, uh, especially in particular a clutch of four songs that he wrote. Right. Kind of in that Great American Songbook sort of style. Joe is totally on the money with this. So the six songs he did uh, in the 60s are, you know, they're fine. And his voice is nice. He sings everything good. So, you know, as always, yeah. he's got the good floor. It's always very listenable. But there's right? no Nothing that's going on our playlist from that. The rest of the songs, there's three especially, Just Like, Walking in the Rain, and Stranger in My Life. Uh, Those are some damn solid songs. Yeah, so he's kind of writing in that style. He's kind of writing songs that are kind of, you know, would fit on a record of jazz standards. Um, You know, Walking in the Rain, specifically, I mean, that really does sound like a lost kind of standard. Uh, You know, it has the big, lush 70s style of his Mm -hmm. orchestrations, the tinkly harps and, like, you know, big big orchestra and what, you know what really you gorgeous give, sounds. What do you give the record? I mean, as a as a record, it really is the ultimate in terms of schism. Yeah, I gave it three. Um, I give it two and a half. Beca- and it's really is like a half and half. You really you really do need the four Marvin Gaye penned songs, which are all I think pretty essential. I would playlist all four of them. Yeah, yeah. Let's we'll take all four. That's fine. And. Um, yeah, and then, then, this then is, the this album was, ends this, with a cover. Yeah, this was to me the best of the three posthumous albums yeah, because of this. Yeah, because yeah. of the side two. Yeah. Uh, then 97, uh, Vulnerable. That's the most recent. It was 25 years ago. It's the most recent Marvin Gaye record. Right, and so I guess some of that stuff was from the Romantic from Yours sessions, right? So, But none of them are originals. So right. this is kind of in that same style with the lush kind of 70s It was style. first being worked on in 68 and then in 77. It's the same kind of weird decade split hodgepodge thing of standards. Right. This one blends into me a lot. The songs all kind of blend in more. I can, you know, um, There's only two in a row that I like. I wish I didn't love you so, and I won't cry anymore. Those two in a row. Yeah, I wish I didn't love you so. Uh, it's kind of like a torch song. That one really seems kind of on the nose, like for him personally. Um, it probably meant a lot to him, that song. Um, that one feels kind of nice and sort of has like kind of a lived in sort of feel to it. Um, but yeah, and generally not, not really a super essential collection. You know, it's always nice to hear Marvin sing and he sounds great as usual, but I mean, um, this, this feels to me like squeezing really hard at the end of the toothpaste tube. Um, yeah. so, you know, the, interestingly, uh, you know, so he had this album, the ballads ready for a 1979 release, uh, on Motown and due that was to the part of the hear my dear fallout, right? Exactly. Right. Yeah. Because of that occurring, uh, they shelved this project indefinitely, but, or he shelved it, but he told David Ritz, he felt the album was the best stuff I ever did. Quote unquote. Oh, okay. Again, not the best judge of his own talents or right. where his strengths lay. Right. Uh, certainly very talented, yeah. not a good judge of Sometimes it, you think. say things on one day, then you think something another day. Mm, he may know. not have really added. Yeah, this <laughs> interesting, I think it was, yeah. it's what makes him a very, very interesting artist and performer yeah. is that he could do all these amazing things, but he thought he was really good at the things that he was not the best at. Yeah, or that I were, this two stars. It wasn't even that he's not the best at, it's just inherently not as interesting as interesting as, you know, as his as other stuff, stuff yeah. yeah uh what do you give this i gave it two i give this pile of turds a two too all right so uh let's talk about uh the shape of this dude's arc i believe as we were just talking about his own misunderstandings about where his talent lay accounts for the lion's share of the reason why his creativity exploded in 1970 in such a fractally magnificent way but then marvin got caught up in conceptual formats untethering himself from those kinds of restrictions by the turn of the next decade it seemed that he'd finally found a valid musical path forward and potentially a shred of inner peace 
but the time of his life was uh, so tragically taken from him uh, at that point. Uh, his top three albums, in my not so humble opinion, not, number three is Let's Get It On. Number two is Here My Dear. Number one is What's Going On. And then worst album for me would either be that's the way that's the way love is or in my lifetime it's kind of a toss-up well we've done it again we have very similar lists <laughs> so i have um pally <laughs> number three i have here my dear number two i have is let's get it on and number one i have is what's going on and there are you know a handful of other ones you know i want you I would put right below those three. I like that re record a lot, but mm -hmm. that's my top three. Um, and then my least favorite album was In Our Lifetime. Um, that one just seems kind of busy and not really very fully realized. Um, yeah, this is all opinion, but um, you know where David's coming from on this one is just wrong. <laughs> 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 I'm just kidding, David. Uh, he's not even here anymore. Yeah, we love himself. you, man. <laughs> we'll get a clip of uh, you saying, that's an outrage. <laughs> uh, anyway, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, most importantly, above all, please uh, follow, subscribe to our podcast on the platform of your choice. Go, you ev wanna... go evangelical in your zeal to promote the show to your friends. We have been on point posting one a week and, and not asking for anything. Please send to your friends. Uh, also, give us a great five-star rating, uh, especially if you listen to us on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Uh, check out our uh, Facebook discussion group. Uh, great place to troll or start an argument. Uh, send us a voice memo using the link in the show notes. Uh, check out our incredible playlist. Look out for our upcoming Patreon episodes. Joe, am I not turning over a stone? I think, I think you're covering pretty much all the bases. Well, great. We'll Any, see you next we'll week. We'll see you next week. We, got, we have more um, more cans to spray. <laughs> That's right. That's right. These cans are going to spray themselves. <laughs> we will see you next week on Discography. Discography.